<clears throat> All right. I think everybody is pretty much here. Good morning. Welcome to the Air Quality Coalition meeting. Happy Friday. Um, I'm gonna get started by sort of walking around the room here and asking you all to introduce yourself um, and where you're from. And then we'll get to the presentations. Randy, I'm gonna start with you. I'm uh, Randy Cook, I'm a retired DHEC and uh, currently living in the upstate, but involved in the coalition for many years. Oh, and by the way, I'm Madeline Adams, in case you didn't guess, I'm from the COG. <laughs> um, June? I'm June Dean. I'm with the American Lung Association. Awesome. Glad to have you. Mary? Uh, Mary Peyton Wall, South Carolina DHEC, uh, Bureau of Air Quality. I'm the section manager for air regulation and data analysis. And I've got Amy Curran in here with me. Hi, Amy. Hey, I'm the outreach coordinator. <laughs> You're not on Bureau camera. Moving over. I'm the outreach coordinator for the Bureau of Air Quality. And yes, we do actually have masks in here, but we're both vaccinated and are okay with it. Yeah, I was going to say, we'll close. Eileen, you're up. Hi, good morning. I'm Eileen Duffy with North Charleston Planning. Charles? Charles, I come mayor of Harleyville. Nice to see you, Mayor. Okay. Um, G. Barright. Hi, I can't figure out how to rename myself right now, but um, I'm Bailey Vincent. I'm here with the Charleston Metro Chamber on our government relations team, and I'm filling in for George Ramsey today. Welcome. Whitney Warner. Hi, I'm with the Waccamaw Regional Council of Governments Transportation Planner. Glad to have you, Whitney. Thanks. John Brooker. Hey, everybody. Uh, my name is John Brooker. I'm with Conservation Voters of South Carolina, and I'm based in Charleston, South Carolina. Thanks for being here. Mark? Hey everybody, Mark Messersmith with the South Carolina Ports Authority. I'm our environmental manager. I'm happy to be here. Thank you, Mark. Katie. Hey all, I'm Katie Zimmerman. I'm with Charleston Moves. Um, we are the bike ped and transit advocacy group in Charleston County. I have a, thank you, Katie. I have a TT Bowie. Good morning. My name is Toy Bowie. I'm a new Santee Cooper employee. Welcome. Jennifer Thank you. Hawthorne. Good morning. I'm Jennifer Hawthorne. I'm an environmental engineer at New Core Steel. Welcome. Brian, I'm going to screw it up. <laughs> Gil Hooley. <laughs> I definitely want to mess that one up. <laughs> that's okay. Brian Gil Hooley. I'm with Repower South. We're in Berkeley County. Welcome. Thank you. Jane Hood. Yes, it's Jane Hood Campbell. Um, I'm a senior director of environmental for Santee Cooper. Welcome. Lots of energy folks here today. Um, Kristen Miguez is I'm actually here. I have a working actually. speaker. <laughs> this is I'm Kristen Miguez. I'm a planner here with the Berkeley Charleston Dorchester Council of Governments. And I have, thank you, Kristen. And Kevin? Yes, this is Kevin Clark, also at Santee Cooper and an even older former South Carolina DHEC employee. <laughs> uh, thank you, Kevin. Sydney Jackson? Hey, good morning. I'm Sydney Jackson, um, Director of Environmental Affairs and Health Services at Cooper River Partners. Uh, at Sky MC, or also known as Bushy Park. Okay, great. Stephanie Sheely. Hello, this is Stephanie Sheely, uh, Santee Cooper. Um, I am a manager of air quality and waste management. And like Kevin, I was also a former D hacker. <laughs> <laughs> D hack is representing today. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> 
I have Madden GR. Is that Renee? I think that might be Renee. So we're going to skip to Susie Gately. Yes, this is uh, Susie Gately, and I'm also with Santi Cooper in air quality, but not, I haven't ever worked at DHEC, so. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, Susie. <laughs> John Lambert. Hey, I'm John, mobility coordinator with BCD COG. Thanks, John. Mayor Rainwater. I'm Christy Rainwater, and I am the mayor of Hanahan, South Carolina. Welcome. Thank you for coming. Thanks. Elaine Morgan. Hi, I'm Elaine Morgan, the CEO of the Brooklyn Chamber. Glad to see everybody. <laughs> nice to see you too. I thought we were going to be in person this time, but not, not quite yet. Uh, maybe next time. Did I miss anybody? Hearing no one, we'll go ahead and get started. Um, up first, we have Mr. John Brooker from the Conservation Voters of South Carolina, and he's going to talk to us about what will replace coal for energy in the future. John, take it away. Great. Thanks, Madeline. Um, I'm going to share my screen here real quick. One second. Um, but good morning, everyone. Thanks for having me. Um, as I said before, this is I'm John Brooker with Conservation Voters of South Carolina. And I'm going to be talking about what will replace coal generation. Can you guys see, can everyone see? Yep. Um, you're just not seeing the presenter view, correct? Um, I think we're... The full screen? Yeah, it's, it's the whole screen. Perfect. Well, thanks. Um, <clears throat> get started here. So what, we're, what will replace coal for energy generation? Um, I'm going to start just... Real quick, if you haven't heard of Conservation Voters of South Carolina, we're a statewide conservation organization fighting for air, land, and water and energy through political action. We're a, a nonprofit of 501c3 and c4, but we also have a PAC, um, and we are bipartisan, pragmatic, and effective. Um, so I'm going to start just kind of by framing what I'm talking about. I mean, I'm sure we have a lot of energy folks on that are aware of this, but we're going through kind of some big shifts in the energy generation world as we see a lot of the legacy coal generation um, coming offline here in the near term future. So we're going to have to see what is going to replace this generation. And that's going to be kind of the next generation of generation. That sounds funny. But the next um, the next cycle of what is powering our homes. Um, so here's a table of coal plant closures in South Carolina. So um, you have these five plants here. You can see the majority of them are closing in the next decade. Um, and so this is this is going to be big. Um, you know, we've we've definitely seen some changes in the energy industry, and you know, we've seen um, you know the need to build more generation facilities. But this will be kind of a, a seminal time where we're taking a huge amount of the fleet off. Um, and then, you know, the main reason for this, you know, aside from pollution and uh, carbon emissions is they're not even economical. Um, at this point, coal, you know, this is a quote at the bottom from Jim Robo, chairman and president of uh, Next Era Energy. And, you know, he explained that there's not an economic coal plant or a coal plant that's operating economically um, in the U.S., so this is just to kind of underscore more of what I'm talking about with, if you see in the blue, so this is uh, South Carolina's energy generation in 2020. And in the, the blue, that's the coal generation that we're gonna see the majority of come offline in the next 10 years. And the way I think about it, I mean, there's definitely, um, you know, the possibility of new technologies coming out and changing what we're seeing with this graph. But really when we're looking at technologies that exist, what's gonna replace that gap is between natural gas in the brown and renewables in the, uh, the red there. So yeah, cause I mean, we're not, you know, if you've been in South Carolina for a couple of years and we're here in 2017, there's not a huge appetite for more nuclear. Um, we're not, you know, really seeing a bunch of 
hydroelectric proposals. So it's really between those two items right now, um, the natural gas and renewables. Um, so if you're looking at natural gas or solar and storage, which is most of what, what, what the projected growth in renewables is in our state, um, you know, we have some questions, you know, what, which of these will take the bigger piece of that coal generation? Um, and some other notes are solar with storage kind of changes the game a little bit because it's what's called dispatchable power. So you can kind of just turn it on and off to a degree, which is one thing that is separated renewables from other kind of com uh, combustion based generation. Um, some other important points to think about is, you know, we're not figuring out what we want to replace coal next year, five years from now. These are long term investments because these plants, a lot of these um, larger facilities, you know, they're not slated to be for 10 years. It's more like 30 or 40 years is what you can expect for some lifespan of natural gas plants or other um, generation facilities. And then some key points that, you know, um, we were tracking a lot of the conversations and discussion around this, some key points to kind of figure out the mix here of what's going to replace coal is price, obviously. The risk to customers is very important, especially here in South Carolina. We're very aware of that reliability is vital. Um, and that's where kind of that some of that dispatchability comes into play. Um, fuel costs and availability has been a big point that our public service commission has um, kind of looked at. Um, with different proposals from our utilities, meaning the price of natural gas mostly, um, and you know, the ability to have pipelines that then bring the natural gas to the facilities that need it. So that's been a big point of contention. And then potential carbon pricing. Um, while this is not something we have now, if you look at the plans that utilities are making, they are planning to potentially have carbon pricing, and that's built into their long range plans. Um, so why am I talking to you about this? Um, this matters for air quality, I'm sure. I'm preaching to the choir here with a lot of people that know way more about air quality than me. But you know, coal has a lot of air pollution associated with that generation. You know, nitrogen oxide, sulfur dioxide, I have a bunch of facts here. You know, two thirds of the sulfur dioxide uh, are from electric power generators. And then I put this little clip at the bottom about particulate matter, because I think it's becoming a kind of an emerging thing people are looking more and more about as far as pollution. Um, and this is actually a study that came out, this is in 2020, associating or correlating um, particulate matter exposure with spread and morbidity and mortality of COVID-19. So I thought that just kind of made it um, poignant. So natural gas, um, while it doesn't have the same reputation for air pollution that coal has, it's still a combustion process and has some associated air quality impacts. You, know, you have nitrogen oxide, it's particulate matter, other HAPs. Um, it's not the same level of, it doesn't um, have the same level of CO2 emissions. Um, honestly, that's kind of a big question mark because if it has half the emissions when it's burnt, but there's a big, um, there's a big question mark as far as how much of the methane or the natural gas leaks um, from the point of extraction to then generation. Um, and then I have a picture here. This is to show that, you know, uh, there is a natural gas facility. This is an article about a natural gas plant in July that was fined um, for an air quality issue. Um, I do have it here <laughs> that the issue has been resolved at the bottom in the green box. But just showing that, you know, I think natural gas is associated with less pollution and people think that, but it's not, um, it's not necessarily clean. And so that's important to think about. Uh, and then moving forward here, you know, we're looking at what's going to, you know, what's going to happen, what type of energy generation mix are we going to get in the future? And then what air quality impacts do we expect from that? And the next question is kind of where are these decisions made? So a big, the majority of these decisions, I'd say a, a big fraction are at the Public Service Commission. If you're unfamiliar, the Public Service Commission, you can kind of think of as the Supreme Court for Energy in South Carolina. And they basically determine, you know, what utilities can and can't do. They're kind of the only line between, or the, the main line between consumers and these monopoly, monopoly utilities. Um, so how they affect kind of renewables versus natural gas. 
is in these four ways. Um, this has a big effect. One is the avoided cost cases. Um, so this is happening right now. This is something that happens cyclically at the commission where they basically approve or help determine the deal that you, the utilities offer to independent solar producers. So if this deal is not viable, we don't see you know, large scale solar coming onto the grid. Um, and that's actually what we've seen for the past two years since the last round. Um, there have not been any contracts signed under the avoided cost case, um, which is like a certain deal that they, they put out. That's kind of the price that they pay them as well as some other contract terms. But so that's really important for how much um, solar we get on the grid in South Carolina. Uh, then also the long-term energy plans um, known in the industry as IRPs or integrated resource plans. So this is how a utility kind of explains or puts forward how it's going to meet customer demand. It also projects the demand that it has is going to have to meet for the next 15 years. So this is where they say, we're going to build this, we're going to build you know this much solar, this much natural gas. Um, so that's really important. This happens at the commission as well. Um, and there's usually opportunities for comment, um, for public input there on all these. Then next um, is this, thing called the Certificate of Public Convenience and Necessity. So this is kind of another decision point. You know, let's say a utility has a plan for some sort of generation plant in their long-term plan. They still have to go through this um, Certificate of Public Need. Um, and so this is where the commission has to approve that this asset is needed. Um, so that's kind of just another point. And then lastly, uh, Dominion actually has a separate proceeding related to their coal closures. So there's nothing kind of scheduled for that at the moment, um, but that's something we'll see here in the future, especially with what you saw with how many coal plants will be closing in the next 10 years um, from that first table I showed. So also looking at the state legislature, because they also affect you know, what happens here. Um, and I thought it'd be good, to, there's not a ton to talk about as far as what's happening in our state legislature for energy. I have a little bit in the next slide, but looking at kind of what has happened and what has happened in other states. So there's renewable portfolio standards or voluntary targets. So if you see that map of the US on the right, um, that shows all different states that have these targets. South Carolina has 2% by 2021, which are meeting. Uh, North Carolina is at 12.5 um, and Virginia is at 100% by 2050. These are just a couple, but you can see there's a lot on the map. Um, it is good South Carolina does have a renewable portfolio standard. Um, but yes, yeah, so this is something that can kind of drive um, renewable growth and kind of change the mix of how much natural gas versus how much um, solar or other renewables our state gets. Um, and then there's coal closure policies. So um, a couple of states have done this. Uh, Virginia uh, basically mandated that most of their coal plants, a couple exceptions, will have to close by 2024. Um, the Illinois Senate, they actually went beyond coal. It's actually um, eliminating fossil fuels altogether by 2045. That is past the Illinois Senate, um, but I think that's still kind of pending. And then um, also we have this huge bill in North Carolina. Um, there's a lot in that bill. Um, I think both good and bad from a conservation perspective. But part of that actually is major coal retirements for North Carolina. So what is happening in South Carolina? You know, one thing is just upcoming decisions on avoided costs. That's happening right now at the PSC. We just finished some hearings um, earlier this month, and we're going to have more hearings mid-October. And then shortly after that, we'll get a decision on avoided cost. Um, and so that's something to pay attention to. And if you want to get involved, about that uh, around that talk to me and then as far as legislation right now the only major bill we're tracking um, is there's this HOA bill so that's a bill that um, it basically just keeps it so that people that if you live in an HOA it makes it so your HOA can't um, restrict you from having solar so it basically just takes away an HOA's right to um, you know restrict solar just needlessly. They're still allowed to put like certain requirements around it. Like you have to put it here or here, but they just can't say no solar. Um, there's possibly some other opportunities as sessions hasn't started yet. And um, 
definitely kind of look to CVSC. We'll be flagging those for folks. And then some things that happened. Um, I'm not sure how many people were paying attention to this, but our commission did reject two long-term energy plans from Duke and Dominion um, for multiple reasons. Um, but both of these plans did call for major investment in large natural gas facilities. Um, so both of those have been um, rejected and modified. They've been approved. Um, but it's kind of the, the first time our commission has done that. Um, also, I'm sure the Santee Cooper people are aware of this, but you know the Santee Cooper um, reform legislation passed, and that now puts Santee Cooper's resource planning under commission oversight, which is a big deal. Um, and yeah, so that's all I have. I went through a ton of information. If you have any questions, feel free to ask. Um, also, feel free to email me and sign up to hear more from CVSC um, at that link below. I can share that in the chat. Thank you, John. Does anybody yeah. have any questions for John? Okay, I have a question for John. <laughs> how does the um, the avoided cost decision affect like how quickly we can move towards more clean energy in South Carolina? Yeah, so um, I think a lot of people think about like solar rulings that happened earlier that were on like rooftop solar, but this is particularly for utility scale solar, which does have a big impact on, you know, just the, the percentage of solar we have in the grid. So what it does is it basically creates an avenue, you know, it opens that door for these independent solar producers to then put energy on the Dominion or Duke's grid um, by providing kind of a standard form approved contract with pricing. Does that make sense? Yes. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah. Does anybody else have a question for John? All righty, John, if you'll stop sharing your screen, we're yeah. going to move on to June at the American Lung Association. Yeah, one second. Let's see. Whoops. One quick question, John. Do you see uh, any legislation to increase the uh, uh, renewable standard goal from 2% in South Carolina and, and make it a standard versus a goal? Um, there's nothing like that at the moment. Um, it's definitely always an option. Um, but yeah, there's, there's nothing concrete. There's definitely people that are interested in that. Um, but there, there, there's no bills that have been introduced. Okay. No, no particular momentum in sight as far as you know. Yep. Thank you. Okay. Next, we have June Dean with the American Lung Association talking to us about the healthy air update. June, take it away. Okay, thank you. I'm a little bit, um, iffy. I'm used, I'm not so used to sharing presenting you know, from Zoom as I am from, um, Team, so I'll have to bridge myself a little bit. You got it. Senior, You're up. Okay. I'm a senior director for advocacy for Georgia and the Carolinas. You all know the American Lung Association. We're the oldest voluntary health agency in the country. We were initially formed to fight tuberculosis. And from those times, we have moved on to some other issues. Uh, one being air quality, which is dear to us. We were the, the first voluntary, first health agency to um, look at air quality in terms of health. And um, we've had a long and storied role with that. I'm going to talk today a little bit about the state of the air report. Um, and I'm going to paint a broad brush because you all know more about the air quality um, in your neck of the woods than I do. And um, I thought you might be interested in how we um, put together the, the state of the air report. It's in its 22nd year. Um, and of course we look at the air report from a position of health. It is essentially a health focused report. And um, we primarily track ozone and particle pollution. They're two of the most widespread and dangerous pollutants. And um, it can cause asthma attacks, respiratory and cardiovascular harm, and even early death. 
uh, particle pollution can also cause lung cancer in some cases. Um, a little bit about who's at risk, the very young, the older, older adults. Um, particle and ozone pollution really is unhealthy for anybody, but certain populations are more vulnerable to health harms. Um, certainly those with lung disease and other pre-existing health conditions. Um, people with low incomes tend to live near areas of higher pollution. Maybe it's a um, factory or maybe it's uh, living on a busy road. And those who work and exercise outdoors, we've long known, are at particular risk on high pollution days. Um, and our report showed that we, people of color were more likely to live in a county with unhealthy air than white people. So I'll talk about that a little more later. Um, the report has basic components that you see every year, um, but it's with an aim to give people information they can use and understand and kind of put it in, in some give it local information and put it in some general terms. And it is a trend report for three years. And it, um, so you're able to see, so one incident doesn't completely skew the whole set of um, grades and ranking that comes out. Let's see, let's get to this report, how, it put, how it's put together. Um, the information we get is from the states, which they collect annually and send to EPA for review. And once EPA vets those numbers, they post the data and we download it and uh, calculate grades and rankings. And after that, we send it back to the states, to each state to look over, to make sure that we have um, the data properly um, shown and uh, confirm the numbers. And that's an important process. And we're very grateful to state agencies who take the time to do that because, you know, sometimes there are errors that we can catch in, in advance. And it also is good for the state agency to see how we're reviewing this. I mean, this is not a review of how uh, state air regulators do their job. It's a review of the state of the air and a lot of things go into it. But our perspective is from, we're looking at what you breathe into your lungs. There's a sample of where the grades come from. And I have the methodology, which is a whole presentation in itself that I can put in the chat for if you're interested in how we arrive at this. Uh, some of the things that sort of came out of the 21 report was that more than 135 million people live in counties receiving at least one F grade, and that's down from 150 million last year. Most of the improvement um, in this year's report was in counties that had failing grades for ozone in the previous year. Uh, this year's report showed an increase though of more than 1 million people living in areas with unhealthy areas of short-term particle pollution compared to last year. And all over this, you know, we're seeing uh, ways that perhaps climate change may be impacting some of this. The, um, another thing we saw was that looking at the data nationwide, uh, we found that people of color are 61% more likely to live in a county with a failing state of the air grade for at least one pollutant. And three times as likely to live in a county with all three failing grades as compared to white people. Climate change is degrading our air quality and increasing the risk of poll air pollution harming health. And as you all know well in Charleston, with um, some of the flooding that you, you see regularly. Um, heat and drought in the Western US are causing wildfires that are larger, more frequent and more widespread. And that's an understatement, you know, at the end of the summer with what we're seeing now. Um, but that's been the primary driver of the increase we're seeing in short-term particle pollution. Heat also, certainly has an important role in ozone formation. And, um, and this is speculation at this point, but 
we think that the reason we showed improvements in ozone levels in the 2017-2019 period is that the year 2016 dropped off of the calculation. And that was the hottest record, the hottest year on record global, globally ever. So um, we'll see what continues here. And of course, it's going to make ozone more likely to form and harder to clean up. And there was a reference earlier to COVID-19. Um, the state of the air report for 2021 doesn't cover um, 2020, so we didn't get the data around the pandemic. So that'll come next year. But we do know that the quality of the air we're breathing, we are breathing does have an impact. As that Harvard study that he um, referenced earlier and several others that have followed, it shows that a community's exposure to even small increases in particle pollution over the long term can lead to an increase in COVID-19 death rates. Air pollution increases susceptibility to respiratory infections. It worsens underlying chronic conditions like heart disease and diabetes, which are more common in communities of color. And these chronic conditions also increase the risk of serious harm from COVID-19. And you know, we'll see a lot more data around that as well. And I've thrown in a link um, with some of the research that we have posted on our website between COVID-19 mortality and air quality. And now let's get to the the list that we have every year. These are the ones that, this is the part of the report usually that gets the most publicity. For 21 of the 22 years we've been publishing this report, Los Angeles has been the number one city most polluted for ozone. And as you can see here, most of these are um, in the Western part of the country. Um, just as a side note, we rank cities by their most polluted county. And we use the definition from the Office of Management and Budget for cities of metropolitan statistical area. Let's see. And I think this is pretty self-explanatory. We talked a little bit earlier about um, the possibility that dropping off 2016 may have made shown some difference for ozone improvements, but there are probably some other things as well. Um, but anyway, it's what goes in your lungs. So we're glad to see any improvements. And this is the most polluted cities for short-term particle pollution. And Fairbanks is sort of a new one on the list. But it, the reason they're up there is because of wildfires. And uh, the worst 25 list, which is a little larger than this, is dominated by cities in the Western US. Um, we did see Pittsburgh metropolitan area added to the list in Lancaster, Pennsylvania. And those are the only two Eastern cities on the list of 25. Particle pollution continues to rise. Um, again, I think that sort of speaks for itself as well. And um, you're seeing the impact of um, drought and wildfires to some degree in this country. And um, of course that filters out this year across our country and hit the East Coast a little bit as well. Most polluted cities for year-round PM 2.5. Um, again, the top 10 is dominated by Western cities. Uh, when you look at the top 25, you see some larger um, industrial cities in the Midwest and East, like Detroit, St. Louis, and New York. Uh, two of these cities had their worst levels ever. 13 of the 25 cities most polluted by particles year-round had, had increased year-round levels.
I will say the Southeast fared the best probably of any part of the country in terms of air quality in the State of the Air report. Um, these are the five cleanest cities uh, that are on the cleanest list for all three pollutants, meaning they had zero days of high ozone or short-term particle pollution and are on the best 25 for year-round particle pollution. Uh, Wilmington, North Carolina, I pay a lot of attention to the states I work in, um, has been on this list for four or five years. And um, I, I don't know, I kind of watch the port cities like Wilmington and Charleston and Savannah. And I don't know the answer to why or what. I know all three have worked hard with their ports to, to clean up um, pollution and manage that. Um, but I also wonder what else may be part of that. And the best part, South Carolina had a pretty good report. Um, Florence and Myrtle Beach were on the list for cleanest for ozone pollution. And five cities were on the list for cleanest for short-term particle pollution. That means zero bad air days. Um, and Florence was on the list for both of these. And I pulled out Charleston, Berkeley, and Dorchester County. So you can see those as well. Charleston area improved for urine particle pollution, but had an additional unhealthy day reported with ozone pollution in this year's report. So that's still in the B category. Berkeley got an A um, around ozone pollution. That means no bad days. Um, as we said earlier, Charleston was ranked as one of the cleanest cities for short-term particle pollution up from a C in the 2019 report to an A in the current SOTA report. Um, and the D and C have to do with whether or not the, the monitors reported a complete set of data that EPA certified. And it may be that, I don't know, you know, you can tell me best whether or not Dorchester County has monitors or, or what that might be. Um, I, they don't have any that I know of, Jean. That's, yeah, and that's, that's the reason. Well, you know, air pollution doesn't observe county lines. So that being the case. Very um, true. <laughs> the um, Clean Air Act is definitely working. It's in its 50th year. And uh, we've seen a downward trend of air pollution as we built a pretty robust economy in this country. Um, we did see things start to level off in our reports around 2017. Um, cleanup efforts have been continuing since that time, but we are seeing the effect of climate change, we think, undoing the progress that's being made, which is what we've been warned about. Um, and, you know, we need to mean, for the Lung Association's part, we need to maintain the Clean Air Act, strengthen the ozone and PM standards, um, as called for in the act to protect public health and double down on climate change. As, as you well know, the um, Clean Air Act calls for a review of the five or six tracked pollutants every five years to make sure that the um, standards are reflecting the, the current best science. And I want to say a little bit about the uh, a project that the Lung Association has been working on this, year, this summer. And we, along with many partners, are on a quest for uh, federal funding to support school districts who want to invest in zero emission school buses. And that um, translates into money in the infrastructure package. Um, the case for us is that uh, are the air impacts and the impacts on health for kids. 95% of school buses are diesel um, that are on the road and they are putting out a ton of pollutants. And we know from many years of research that um, 
Air pollution is detrimental to children's lung function and educational attention, attainment. So 25 million students ride school buses in this country each day, inhaling dangerous diesel exhaust fumes. And um, this looks like a good fit if we can make it happen. Um, another part of our interest in zero emission school buses is that um, it has the potential to eliminate millions of tons of greenhouse gas emissions, no doubt about it. Um, our original ask was along with what the administration first put forth was for 20 billion to replace one fifth of diesel buses. And um, we've come, we didn't quite attain that. We've got 2.5 billion in the infrastructure package right now. And we're hoping to keep it. There's a small possibility for more in the reconciliation budget. Um, you know, and, and the reason for this big ticket item, which looks pretty big to me, but it is important, is that um, school systems are probably going to be reluctant to make the initial investment in zero emission school buses um, out of their own budget. Um, they're, they are pretty cost. They're just ramping up. And, um, you know, this money can help give a leg up. They can um, hopefully, with money allocated, get grants from the EPA to establish those. But once they bought them, um, we're told the maintenance costs are much less than costs for maintaining diesels. So some of that cost can be recouped over time. Um, we did some polling this summer on electric school buses, and uh, you see the numbers there. Um, the full report is posted on our website for polling. Uh, and we oversampled in Georgia, West Virginia, and Arizona. And for Georgia, which I think is pretty comparable to South Carolina, we um, had support both from um, the Republican, Independent, and Democratic sides of the fence. It was a truly nonpartisan issue in their responses. And there wasn't a lot of difference between urban and rural responses there as well, which I found pretty interesting. We're told um, by the Bluebird people that um, a charge can go last 90 miles. So um, that that covers a lot of um, school bus routes for most of the country. And, you know, they probably could be charged during the day as well. And I believe that South Carolina has um, an electric school bus manufacturer beginning to come online around the Greenville area too. So it's another example of um, renewable energy also improving the economy and adding jobs. And I just wanted to say a little bit about the Lung Association's advocacy side of things in terms of air quality. Um, we do that through our Healthy Air campaign. And a lot of it is educate, educate, educate. You know, we find the more people know the more they support clean air and clean energy. So um, that is an ongoing task. We're also wanting to be sure that we reaffirm the role of sound science and decision-making and um, increase the focus on health impacts for both climate change and air quality. But um, the more you know, the better the decisions are on our behalf. So again, I had, I think I had to get old to learn this. I've always been in an advocacy role, but more and more I see the importance of education. And I wanna thank you for inviting me today. Um, I just tried to paint a broad brush 
of our state of the year report so that you know a little more about how it's put together. You're the experts, you know this stuff much better than me, and you can tell me a lot about what's going on in your community, and I'm happy to answer any questions. Thanks, June. Does anybody have any questions for June? I, I have a question. Um, hey, June, how are you? Hey, fine. Um, I, I've been, uh, you know, we have a couple of large transportation projects, um, highway projects um, in Charleston County. And each time I've read the either the draft EIS or the supplemental EIS, talking about localized air toxics um, on impacted communities, but the project um, team asserts in both that there, there's not really a there's not a great way yet to to study that and so they don't and then the end conclusion in that paragraph is but it's probably fine because vehicles are vehicle emissions are are getting cleaned up with federal requirements and i was curious if the american lung association is is working with the epa on getting those, figuring out that research um, so that it's, so that we actually know the answers when these draft EISs are, are done for huge, huge highway projects. I know, and there's a lot of things that need to be done in terms <laughs> of this. And, and um, we've had a rocky road with, with EPA uh, in the past four years. I mean, and for example, just, you know, we had some, some improved vehicle standards for um, cars coming out of the Obama administration. They were retracted or held in place and not, it didn't go forward in the Trump administration. And so now we're back trying to get those reinstated. Um, you know, some of this may be improved by um, zero emission vehicles, things like that, looking ahead, but we do need more research and we don't need the EPA limiting some of the research that um, happened in the last administration. You know, we need to see all the science, but I think as, um, zero emission vehicles and um, some of these alternatives do come become more viable. We're going to see more research and it's going to be easy, you know, easier to do. And, and again, we look from the health side, you know, we're looking to see asthma attacks, things like that. Right. Thank you. Any other questions for June? You know, if there's an interest in this 35 page methodology, I'll put it in the chat, but if, if you're okay, I mean, some people like to dive into that. I don't so much, but I'll hold back if you're not that interested in it. I would, I would say there's probably somebody with some interest on this call, June, go ahead and put it in there. <laughs> All right, I'll do it. Let me see if I can negotiate my way through. Um, and if not, you can just email it to me and I'll email it out to the crowd. So that's it. That's okay. Easy. Okay. I only get fascinated with it once a year when we're um, releasing this report. So. Gotcha. It's nice to see South Carolina, some South Carolina cities doing, you know, better on the, um, on the list there Be, being in the clean list. That's, that's cool. Well, you know, like I said, we all share the same air and, yep. you know, um, we get air in Atlanta from Birmingham that combines with Atlanta and moves on to Charlotte and spills over into Greenville and Rock Hill and all that area. And yes, um, ma'am. How we work. Let's see if I, I'll, I'll work on trying to put this in while you move on with your meeting. Thank you again for coming to talk to us. And um, we're going to move on to the air quality regulatory process with Mary Payton Wall.
Mary, do you want me to do the? Yes, please. I'm not even going to attempt to share my screen. Gotcha. They right. still frown I'm upon gonna... Zoom here at state government, so I'm not even going to uh, attempt to have IT come after me. I understand. <laughs> um, let's see. If I can remember how to work PowerPoint. Here. Okay. Everybody see that? Okay, great. I'm going to turn my video off. And um, Mary? Sure. So I recognize at least half of the names that are on here, which means y'all have an air permit and are probably a little familiar with uh, air regulations, maybe, maybe not the state implementation plan. Um, for the rest of you, this will probably be the most riveting 10 minutes of your day <laughs> to uh, hear about the regs in South Carolina. Um, Again, I'm Mary Payton Wall, section manager for air regulation and data analysis. So yes, one half of my section does regs. The other half of my section, when y'all get one of the presentations with the um, air quality trends, that is also my, um, my section that we do that. Um, next slide. All right, so what is the SIP? And that is our state implementation plan. And what this is, is the EPA establishes the National Ambient Air Quality Standards, the NACs, for each of the criteria pollutants listed below. And this is our plan of how we tell the EPA that we are going to attain the NACs. Um, and this is all done through our SIP. And it's not just one document. And so I do get a question occasionally of, can you send me a copy of the SIP? Um, at this point, it would probably take about an 18 wheeler um, for me to send somebody a copy of the SIP. Um, so it's a series of documents. And we started back in the early 70s um, with submitting that. And that one, actually, I could give you a copy of because it's only about maybe 20 pages long. Um, and so some of our regulations are part of the SIP, not all of them. Um, I do want to mention that most recently the uh, EPA reviewed and retained both the PM and the ozone NACs in 2020. Um, however, they are going to uh, consider, reconsider the PM, um, and there is going to be a revised standard that will be proposed uh, according to EPA in the summer of 2022 with a final plan for the spring of 2023. Um, so when a, a standard is changed, that starts a clock that uh, we're required uh, to submit our recommendations to the EPA of whether we need attainment or not. And that is due one year from the final standard. Then we will submit a revised SIP within three years of the final standard. And anytime we modify our state approach, then we have to amend our overall SIP. All right, next slide. So they kind of fall into a couple of categories. Um, we can have the state adopted control measures. These are our rules and regulations. I mentioned that some of our regulations are in the SIP and some of them are not. Um, we can't remove or change any portion of the SIP unless we can demonstrate that that change uh, will result in equal or lower concentrations for the criteria pollutants. And that's our anti-backsliding. So sometimes you might hear us mention that we can't do that because it would be considered backsliding. Um, then there can be source specific requirements. Um, some of you may be familiar with the NOx SIP call. Uh, so that was where some of this, this, those will be a source specific. We can actually have um, and we're about to, to go down this path for the first time in South Carolina of having source specific as in facility specific requirements in the SIP as we work on our regional haze SIP. So next slide. All right, then um, we have the non-regulatory components of our SIP. Um, these are um, things that we typically will have. Um, and, Particular, I want to point out, like the emissions inventories, we are required to submit an emissions inventory with, when we update our SIP. And I have the monitoring network on here. I, I kind of want to make sure I, I make it clear. There is a monitoring plan that we use that we work with EPA that shows where our monitoring network is, what's operating, what's not. That is not in our SIP because that would limit us on being able to move a monitor should a monitor need to be moved to meet um, regulatory requirements. So I just wanted to Kind of point that out that that would remove our flexibility. So, all right, uh, next slide. 
And then our last one here, there could be a um, requirement to send out, um, you know, SSM, um, SIP requirements, also the NOx SIP call, any of these things where the EPA sends out something that tells the state you have to do this. All right, so next slide. So what happens when we need to update the SIP, but we're not updating our regulations? So the first thing we would do is we would put in a notice of general public interest that goes into the state register. Um, next. So then we have a 30 day comment period for the public. They're allowed to comment on the proposed SIP revision. All right, next. And then we will offer a public hearing. Now I will point that we may hold a public hearing. If we are not asked to hold one, we will cancel it because we would literally have a hearing with just our staff. So we don't have to do that unless somebody requests it. All right, next. All right, one more, okay. And then we will consider any public comments and if those are necessary, and then we would submit the final SIP document to the EPA for approval. Next. All right. And if the EPA approves our SIP change, then they will publish that approval in the Federal Register. And so that is what makes the SIP final is when we get our approval in the Federal Register. All right. So what happens when we need to update our regulations? And so some of you will be familiar with this process right here. We will do a notice of draft. What this is is basically it's, it notifies the public, we are opening our regulations, we have to list the specific regulations that we are opening, and then we will have a 30 day comment period on that. The next step is that I will go in front of the board and I will present the regulations that we would like to propose and I will ask for permission to propose those regulations and again that goes into our state register. Now, I do want to point out something about our state register. That is the um, process in which we do our public noticing. Um, and it is only published one day a month, which is the last or the fourth Friday of the month. So anytime we want to do something that needs to be public notice, we have to keep that kind of thing in mind. All right, um, so the next we have our notice of proposed regulations. This is where we start our 30 day comment period on the proposed regs. And then we also send a pre-hearing SIP package to the EPA where they get the chance to review it for 30 days as well. All right, so the last step there would be the hearing before the boards. So this is a public hearing. We will notify everybody at which um, board meeting we will be doing the hearing at, and that is open to the public for them to come and make final comments. All right, um, next. We will have a the notice of our final regulation, and so again, if you'll many people will notice that our board meetings are always the second Thursday of the month. The second Friday of the month is when we do our filing to the state register. So all of our final regulations would be considered effective on the fourth Friday of the month, where we would have our, our board meetings. So those dates are set um, on purpose. So the next one is just uh, next slide is. Just wanted to give an idea this is not meant for you to be able to try and read every bit of it but this shows you the steps that we go through when we're trying to update our regulations and it gives you these are very specific times um we have to follow this there is a time frame that we have to meet from the state register we have exactly 12 months from the date that our notice of drafting is published if we miss that date or any of these dates it could delay us and we could potentially have to start the process all over again. So if you go to the next slide, um, I can point that out specifically of a, with a couple of things here. So this is our last time that we went to the General Assembly. Anytime we need to update a regulation that is not directly from the EPA, so it's one of our state regulations, we have to go to the legislature. So everything you see, which is highlighted there, that involves other people, not just my staff. And so you'll notice their internal stakeholder means this is where we need to say, okay, we need to open these regulations. These are the things that we need to discuss. Then there's going to be a lot of external stakeholders. And so we do um, pull in um, industry consultants, um, attorneys, that part to go through what needs to be done here. Now, what's specific about this particular one was this is what we started in 2018. Unfortunately, a hurricane hit the date that we were supposed to have our public hearing in front of the board. So we were ended up being 13 days late submitting our final package to the state register, and we literally had to start the entire process all over again with a notice of drafting. 
And so this particular package did not end up at the state legislature until March and uh, March of 2019. And it has to be at the legislature for 120 days in order for it to move forward. Um, so it had to sit over there and did not get passed until March of 2020. So this was a pretty long one and can go through um, part of the, the complications of what we have to do when we need to update our regulations. All right, the next slide is my attempt at a joke for regulations. Um, this is actually a flow chart out of the legislative manual that shows what I need to do if I have to go to the legislature. So this is an attempt at being funny. You don't need to you know, try and read any part of that, but it is an extremely complicated process. Um, and so when we talk about going to the General Assembly and I have to follow all these steps to make sure that my, my regulation goes through. All right, next slide. <laughs> so who do we work with? This is very important because it is a team. So you'll notice that there is the EPA is on there. We have our legal team. We have our subject matter experts within DHEC. And importantly, we have the industry stakeholders and public involvement. So they are part of this process every step of the way. Um, I do present that information to the board in my final presentation on the dates where we had um, external stakeholders and public involvement. So it's a very important part of our process. And last slide, um, we have three divisions here in air quality and um, I'm in the one at the lower right emissions evaluation support. We have had a, a reorg in the last year. Um, but we work with all three divisions and it's, it's very nice the division that my section got moved to because I can't submit a SIP without going through emissions inventory and modeling and they're now in my division. I work very closely with permitting. We work very closely with compliance management. So um, just really wanted to point out the teamwork that we do here in, in the Bureau to try and make these things happen. Um, matter of fact, we're working on a couple of things right now um, to move forward where we will have to have all the support. So we are going to be doing a general assembly package starting next year. So some of you might end up on um, one of our groups. Um, we need to do this so in order to open our state regs to the general requirements to allow for e permitting. Um, right now, all of our state regs say you have to submit a written application. So we're going to update that language to allow for electronic submittal of applications. And that is really all I have. And I didn't actually have a, a question slide, but if y'all need my contact information, most of you know me and can find me anyway. Um, otherwise, I can put it in the chat or get it to um, Madeline. And if anybody has any questions, I'll be happy to answer those. Thank you, Mary. That was crazy, that spreadsheet. <laughs> For that, yeah, that's, um, that's flow the flow chart. I was like, oh my God. <laughs> about a regulation, but. We try and, you know, you got to be, you got to have something funny in there. Hey, do you have a question for Mary? Yeah, I'm sorry. I, no, don't be sorry. <laughs> it's a, it's, it's a similar question that I asked June, but sort of from, from your agency perspective, um, are you, are you seeing, or, or maybe DHEC is engaging on this and it's just not out in the public. Um, it, that similar, you know, the localized air toxics measurements with with projects specifically. I'm looking at big highway projects, um, and again, the the message in these draft EISs is, is there's not a great way to research that yet, so they're just sort of not touching it. Do you at DHEC are are you sort of anticipating that changing? Are you seeing more reliable research that's going to influence? how how projects are examined going forward or or maybe in the future far in the future <laughs> um i probably know enough to be dangerous but not really give you the best answer i possibly could um okay um i don't know if mark is still on here or not but there is a group that works with we have a the spa has a site we're working with um the um dot putting out a, um a monitor to when the spa um, mm -hmm. expansion. And so we did do something there. Um, there's also been a grant that has been offered to us that we are taking advantage of to put out for ethylene oxide. 
And so there's some ethylene oxide collection that's going on in the uh, North Charleston area. I am not part of that project. So I can tell you it exists. Um, so I can tell you that we are doing some of that. It is very hard to speciate in, 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 for our monitors. And so these are what they put out as an actual canister that is specific to capturing ethylene oxide. So um, I, I will stop there. And if you want more information, I can find you the people that would be better answering that question. I'm just not part of the project. That's great. Thank you. One of the things, Katie, I'll add to that, that um, what, you know, with the personal monitors, you know, if there's, if, if many people working with it, you know, because Lancey got a whole ton of personal monitors to look at things, but one of the, one of the issues we had with that is that the standards aren't really set. We didn't really have a standard that you could measure for the short-term spikes that people were really concerned about, and that was one of the problems of trying to, you can gather all this data, but you can't really turn around and say it's in violation because we got spikes here several times a day, so I think that's part of the reason trying to figure it out. I mean, you can gather lots of numbers and, and probably learn from it, but it's just hard to, you know, it's hard to take it um, from right before side and say, hey, we're going to do something because this is violating something. You know, that was part of the issue. Yeah, and we, and we have to be careful with those, those sensors is that they aren't federal reference monitors. And so that's, um, we have to be um, mindful of that as we move forward. Now, the, the canisters they're putting out this is part of an EPA uh, grant money. So they are working with EPA on that. All right, any other questions for Mary? I know regs are just so exciting and the SIP is just the most amazing thing ever. <laughs> it's, it's, it's bewildering is what it is. <laughs> it's, uh, it seems very complicated, but um, I'm glad that you're there to do it. <laughs> Okay, well, does anybody have any other um, things that they'd like to share with the, with the committee? Any projects going on? Any, anything exciting happening? All right then, with that, I will wrap it up. Everybody have a lovely day. Thank you for coming. Appreciate all the input and especially to our presenters. Have a great day. Yeah. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye. Thank you. Thank you.